church, let us stand. We're going to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's put our hands together. to start this morning off. You know, um, we, we celebrated Easter last week and what a celebration it was. Just the whole week and all the events and across both campuses. Um, but we sometimes get so caught up in just that one Sunday, we forget that is a victory that we get to celebrate 
every day and every Sunday. So praise be to God, it is so good to be together. On this day, those that are joining us online, welcome to you. If you are visiting with us for the first time, I wanna just draw your attention to these connect cards that are in the seat pockets in front of you. Or maybe you're not visiting the first time. Maybe you've just kind of been hiding, but now you're ready to fill one out and we would love to connect with you. So you can fill that out, turn it into any member of our host team or that black box by the exit. And this will allow us to reach out to you and answer any questions you have. There's also a space for prayer requests on the other side. And um, I know that there is a lot to pray for and be in prayer about. And it is our um, blessing as a church family to do that with and for each other. So if you turn that in, to the black box or a host team member um, or anything that you leave here on the prayer wall throughout the service today. Our prayer ministry team will be praying over about that in the week ahead. Um, when you came in, you might have noticed if you haven't grabbed one of these discipleship workshop cards, that is available. We hear a little bit more about that in the news. But also Kairos. Kairos Ministry is one of, um, one of our most beloved ministries here at the church. We have several members that are very active in it. And there are lots of ways for us to support it. This is a group of men that go into the prison and they work with, um, with these incarcerated um, people that are coming to Christ and coming to know Jesus and um, who are experiencing redemption and what seems like just a very difficult circumstance. And so it's a great way to support them. Check that out. There's, you can bring cookies and there's prayer chains. I think we have some meal tickets back there you can purchase and um, just support that ministry. Let's take a look at the news and learn more about our discipleship workshop. Well, hey friends, you might remember at State of the Church, our annual vision night, that I began the year by mentioning three major initiatives for our church, dynamic worship, deepening discipleship, and devoted witness. These are initiatives or ways that we're focusing on fulfilling God's mission here. And, and in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be talking to you in, uh, about discipleship. And this fir the first step of this is really to evaluate where we are. And you're gonna hear us talk about an assessment as well as a discipleship workshop on Saturday, April 13th, 9 to 2 p.m. I, I want you to be there. I wanna encourage you to come and, and register for this. We have childcare and there's gonna be lunch provided. Um, the time together that we're gonna spend is gonna help us come out with some common language about where we are and our approach to spiritual formation, our approach to helping people grow to know and to follow and to share Jesus and to be able to move in the same direction as we do that. We'll be hearing from Ascending Leaders founder, Mike Johnson, along with Harry Veen. These are specialists in helping churches form pathways for folks to grow in their relationship with Jesus. So whoever you are, wh whatever your church background, if you call Foundry your home, if, if you're seeking God and you want to know God better, but you also wanna be a part of helping our church, help other people know Christ better, then I want you to really consider being here. You might think nine to two, that's kind of a long event, but in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to our relationship with Christ, that's really nothing. Um, and so there are some things that we really are dreaming and hoping and praying for that will only happen if we come together and share with one another and listen to one another and learn from one another. This isn't a, a workshop about praying or reading the Bible more. It's about us coming together as a family, as the body of Christ, to do what he has called us and empowered us to do, to be the kinds of followers of Jesus that help other people follow Jesus as well. So I hope you'll join us. It's gonna be such an important time together. Go to foundrychurch.org slash events. And I really look forward to seeing you all there. First Peter at um, chapter two, verses 24 and 25 reads that he himself bore our sins on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. For like sheep, we have all gone astray, but now we have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. Heavenly Father, we gather in your name, Lord, with just gratefulness. Gratefulness, Lord, that your victory is ours again and again and again over and over, day after day after day, Lord. 
And like the great shepherd, Father, you draw near to us. You long to call us yours. You long to lead us and to guide us. God, by your wounds, healing is made possible for us. In this hour that you have given us to come together as your church, Lord, I pray that your spirit would fall fresh on us. I pray that whatever weariness or worry or distraction may be brewing in this room and our hearts and our minds, Lord, that you would dispel all of it. That in your holy name, God, we would experience your presence, your provision, and your power in this day and in this moment that we would be led by you in all things, God, that we would hear your voice in a new and fresh way. Lord, you have given us to each other, but Lord, most of all, you have called us your own. We praise you. Let us worship in that spirit this morning. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. If we could stand to our feet as we continue in worship.
He's more than enough. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Yeah. 
Well, hey, Foundry family, I just wanted to take a moment just to celebrate and give thanks for all those who helped us last week make Easter week such a great week. We welcomed more than 4,500 people in person and online for our 12 Easter week services. And I know so many people across our venues shared with me how meaningful, moving, rich, um, life-changing even the services were. And as we celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday, it's a reminder just that it's an everyday uh, recognition of God's goodness and faithfulness and the resurrection and its power in our everyday lives. Uh, we also welcomed another 3,000 plus through our community egg hunts. And our prayer is that folks find a church home as we reach out and invite them to our campuses for those events. I'm also so thrilled to say that thanks to your generosity, we raised $122,407 for our new initiative in Costa Rica. This is a huge step towards our goal of planting a church in the next three to five years. And I'm so grateful for your faithfulness and I just can't wait to see the long-term kingdom impact from this opportunity that we have. So thanks again, it's just an opportunity to celebrate what God's doing and give thanks to you for that as always. Uh, you can give to this work, um, to the work of Foundry, to God's work here at Foundry to help people know, follow, and share Jesus in so many ways. You can give in the ways that are listed on the screen wherever you are. If you're in person with us today, there are boxes at the exits where you can give as well. Let's pray. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the resurrection and what it means every day for our lives and help us, Lord, to be witnesses of that, to in all the ways we can to share uh, with the world the hope of Jesus. So would you fill us with your Holy Spirit and move us forward and help us, Lord, to leverage everything that you have blessed us with for your good in this world, for the kingdom work that you have for us. Make us faithful to that. Give us courage and wisdom as we move forward. Uh, protect us from the enemy and help us, Lord, to, to fulfill the work of helping people know, follow, and share Jesus. We give you thanks for your goodness and pray that you continue to use all that we are and all that we have for your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah. 
May we know the nature of God as he has revealed himself through scripture. Creator, revealer, king, judge, priest, father, shepherd, redeemer. Well, good morning. It is a, I'm still pumped and it's a joy from last week. Um, not just the amount of people that we had and all of our services and that kind of stuff, but I saw Foundry show up um, last week. Even in this particular service where we were jam-packed and people were standing in the back, um, had some of our own folks come and offer their own seats so others could, could share, uh, and they were willing to stand. And I think that spirit of hospitality is part of what we need to continue to foster um, as a church together. On Saturday, uh, Mar uh, April 13th, um, am I getting that date right? My Saturdays, yeah, are all mixed up. Um, we're gonna have an adult uh, discipleship workshop. It's gonna entail students as well. But if Foundry is your home, and, and Ray said this, if you receive spiritual blessing and leading and nourishment from this church, I want to encourage you to please sign up for this event. It's from nine to two, and I know it sounds like a lot, you're like, but what in the world are we gonna be covering? Here's the thing, we dedicate a lot of time to a lot of things all during the month. And I wonder how much do we actually spend time thinking about how we grow spiritually? What, what does that look like? Especially if you're in a life group or you're leading a life group, want to lead a life group, a small group of any kind, please sign up for this. We're gonna meet in this very same room we're gonna be learning about how is it we grow spiritually and what does that look like? What are the implications for us as a church? So go to foundrychurch.org slash events and you got lunch that'll be provided for you, childcare, if that's, I wanna try to remove all impediments. I know you're traveling, I know some people are gonna be looking at the eclipse and maybe stay there for the entire week. I don't know where it is you're going and what you're doing, but if you can be back Saturday, I think it'd be great for the life of the church. There's things that only we can do when we come together. And then following the workshop will be an assessment that we're gonna ask everyone to do. <clears throat> this assessment isn't just a, um, a personal assessment, which you're gonna get and you'll be like, oh, here's where I am and I feel like pretty good about where I am. It's gonna be a spiritual temperature of where we are as a church. This will help us, I think, moving forward as we create common language and handles of how we move forward in the different spaces that we're to walk into if we are to grow in maturity in Christ. And as we understand our, our relationship with Christ, and what that means is that we are in, on a trajectory. We're growing it, and we all grow at different um, rates and the different um, spaces with folks. So if this is something you're, you're saying, man, I, this is something that's tugging at my heart, whether you're new to Foundry, you've been here 28 years, or you're all 28 minutes in to Foundry, I wanna invite you um, to show up on Saturday. I think it'd be really good. We're gonna continue in our series, uh, Facets of God. And we're looking at how God has chosen to reveal himself to humanity all throughout different roles throughout Scripture. And throughout Scripture, we read about a God who is constantly meeting people where we are. And he reveals himself to us and not just say, hey, what's up, I'm here, and then we can keep, keep living our lives however we want. 
He reveals himself with the purpose of not only getting to know us, but he says, now I want to form your character. I want to make you more and more into my image. So there's a question that comes from that. If God is revealed to us, then why in the world wouldn't we trust a God that is trustworthy? The inverse is true, though, that if we get to find out about who this God is and he's not trustworthy, then why would I follow him? But I think it begs the question, is God a trustworthy God or not? And as we read scripture and look at testimonies, there's nothing that that contradicts that. If anything, we we become more aware of a God who is trustworthy at, at every level. All of us, at some level, are following something in our hearts. I don't know what it is for you, I don't know what it's been, but all of us are following something. Sometimes it takes a little bit of just quiet for us to discern what's really in our hearts and what we're following. And I'm not just talking about our social media and stuff. I'm talking about what are we really following in our hearts? What's our yearning for? Psalm 23 speaks to some of these yearnings that I believe have been placed in our hearts. And this is a very well-known passage, incredibly familiar to most of us when we usually read it at funerals for some reason. I think it encompasses a little bit about our life, but I think this psalm is really about our everyday life, not just about death. And I would like for us to to take a minute to read it together. Some of you may have committed this to memory, but let's read this Psalm 23, six verses together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. These are profound words for us. These words, for some reason, bring incredible comfort to our souls. When people are struggling, they tend to go to this psalm of all the other psalms. But I think it speaks to us because as I just mentioned a few seconds ago, There are longings within us. When you long for peace, when you long for rest, when you long for security, when you long for protection and mercy, these things inside of who we are that God created us, we are crying out for these things. And these are the things that the psalmist is crying out for right here, for peace and for rest and for security, protection of all sorts, which is saying the only provider of these things and fulfillment of this is God himself. Leading up to this week, we've looked at the different facets of God that seem to dominate scripture. There are eight different ones, Dr. Alan Coppich says, and there are different metaphors and images for us, and not one single image or metaphor fully captures for us who God is. That's why it's good to see them in its totality. There are all these different sub-roles that fall under this, so if we haven't touched them, most likely they fall under one of these. He spent about 23 years studying this. We've looked at God as, as creator, personal revealer, king, judge, father, and today we're gonna look at him as shepherd, And what are the implications for us? Now, in the Old Testament times, or 2,000 years ago, it wasn't unusual for a leader to be referred to as a shepherd. Now, what kind of shepherd is where I think Christianity makes it a little bit different. But it wasn't unusual for the leaders of countries and rulers to be referred to as shepherds. The earliest depiction of God as a shepherd is in Genesis chapter 49, referring to the promise of Jacob, a blessing over his sons. And he says, the mighty one of Jacob, and this parenthetical phrase appears, the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Now, if you're to read the Bible carefully, you're going to come across this theme of shepherd. You find language around that all throughout, very carefully tethered. But I think one of the reasons, and metaphor works really well, is that God chose it because human beings are a lot like sheep in many ways. Not because we're cute and cuddly, but the reality is 
as we press in, we'll look at what sheep are, and I think you'll see similarities about who we are. Sheep are incredibly dependent creatures. They can't survive on their own. They need someone to lead them, to protect them, to take care of them. It's impossible for them to offend for themselves. The very livelihood of a sheep depends on a shepherd. The question is, what kind of shepherd will he or shepherdess will be? What would that look like? I think this is where Christianity starts to make the distinction about the kind of shepherd, not just one that is in, in front of or that rules or guides, but out of his nature and character. In the Old Testament, we get this glimpses of, of God as shepherd and Israel being his flock. It says, here, a shepherd of Israel, you have led sh- Joseph like a flock. And then you see it again in Jeremiah 31. He who has scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd in his flock In Ezekiel chapter 34, it says, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when some of his sheep have been scattered abroad, so I will seek out my sheep. This is a shepherd who says, I will go after those sheep that are not mine right now. This begins to speak to us about this idea that sheep are lost, that we are lost. So God is a God that pursues us with intentionality. And it's not this idea that, oh, the sheep are lost and they'll come back one day. They'll just make their way back. Sheep don't come back. Once sheep wander away, they're completely lost. We have this dog, a little chihuahua. And you're like, of course you have a chihuahua. Um, Yes, we do. And this little chihuahua, every time we let him out in the backyard, she'll try to sneak out the side gate and she goes out to the front and she's yapping at everybody and she thinks she's all that in a bag of chips. She's running around. We've gotten to the point where I can hear her out front and I don't care. I don't care. I was like, if she might come back and it's okay if she doesn't come back. I'm okay, my daughter's not in here. She's in youth right now, so don't, don't tell her this. But I'm okay with that. I think the only one that would be crushed would be my daughter if this dog did not return. If Hazel doesn't come home, it's okay. We have really good neighbors, unfortunately, and they come back. He's like, hey, your dog's in front. I was like, that's not my dog. I was like, prove it. It doesn't even have a collar. You can't even say that's my dog. I don't want this dog inside. But here's the thing, that dog always always shows up. We'll sit there outside the front door. We'll just sit there and wait for us to open the door. That's not the image that we get from God when he's lost a sheep. He goes after it at whatever length needed to bring that sheep back to himself. And we get this beautiful imagery of a God who provides and guides and protects and heals and restores. Remember, every facet of God ultimately culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. And we see that also in the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd and he talks about him being the gateway. He says, I'll just read it. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought them out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The sheep have this uncanny ability to recognize their shepherd's voice, which for me tells me they're not that stupid. They can understand and recognize specific sounds. I think almost like a mother can recognize their child's cry or the owner of their dog's bark. From this passage, very quickly, we see here that sheep can hear and recognize the shepherd's voice. The shepherd knows his sheep by name. He has created you. He has made you in your mother's womb. He tethered you together. You're here with a purpose. He knows the amount of hairs on your head or the amount of hairs you don't have on your head that you're missing and once you had. The sheep, once they recognize Sheep follow, sheep trust. But it, it insinuates that, that sheep discern. So I wonder for us, as sheep, whose voice are we listening to? We're hearing stuff, we're following stuff, but do you know what you listen to? Do you know what you follow, what you're patterning your life after? Because if you don't, let me tell you, the world will tell you what you ought to pattern your life around so discern what you hear 
what you're following. And I've always wondered how sheep knew this stuff. I know it takes proximity. But Andy Cunningham, the pastor at Fry, shares this story that when he was in the Holy Land, they saw these shepherds coming together. I don't know, they were looking at their March Madness brackets and they brought their sheep and there were a couple hundred at each and all their sheep everywhere. And somebody in Andy's group asked, he goes, how do these sheep know who their shepherd is? And they said, I don't know, let's kind of watch, see what happens. If it's just like they didn't care like, I just, as long as I have 100 sheep, I'm good. As long as you have your 200, we're good, right? It didn't work that way. It says the shepherds started to, to go their own way. They came from different directions, and they started to go different directions. And then they, they would make a sound. I, I, I don't know what sound they made. I'm not a shepherd. Like, I don't know what it sounded like. If there was a Mexican shepherd, maybe that's what it sounded like. And, then, and all of a sudden, these sheep start going after, after their particular shepherd. And they walked away, and they would make these sounds and talk to their sheep. He says that he knows them by name. I think of Gru and the minions and he, how he names them all these crazy little names. But God knows us. We were designed and created to hear the shepherd's voice. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is teaching about worry and anxiety and he refers to us as his little flock. He says, do not be afraid, little flock, knowing that we're gonna be anxious as well. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom because sheep tend to be anxious little creatures. And Jesus knows this about us. As we read in the New Testament, we see that the body of Christ, the church, is one of the main metaphors used. Family and then flock is one of them. That when you come to Christ, you become part of his body. You become one of his flock. And here we begin to benefit from the, the role of God as, as a nurturer, as one who cares for us, guiding and protecting us. God's characteristics as shepherd have vast implications for our lives. God provides. He provides for his people over and over. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Other version says, I lack nothing. He leads. He directs the way we ought to go. He takes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He protects his people. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table in the presence of my enemy. A table was more of a plateau than an actual table that you and I think of. It's a plateau, and you would take your sheep up high, and from there they could protect, because they could see what was coming at them. Any predator, any thief, they could see, they could identify. And then a shepherd gathers and nurtures, bringing those sheep that have gone astray. And this is where we get this idea of being lost. So God is shepherd, this dimension of sin is where we get this idea of being lost, of going astray from the guidance of the shepherd. So when we refer to people who are not close to Jesus, we refer to them as being lost. It's not a derogatory term, it's an expression tied to an imagery. That this is a sheep that is on their own, away from the shepherd. A sheep away from its shepherd is incredible danger. Incredible danger. They're not benefiting from the leading, the provision, the guidance, the nurturing, and protection of the shepherd. They're on their own. So this idea of salvation then comes into, tied into this idea of sin, that if one is wandering and one is lost, then the inverse of that is that you're being found. So I always, I think it's funny when people talk about their relationship with Christ and said, I found Jesus when I was 15. I was like, Jesus wasn't lost. You were lost. You were the sheep. So he found us. The reality is that however we came to Jesus, I understand the sentiment behind it, is that he came to us. He found us while we were still yet dead in our sin. So the shepherd comes to us and he finds us and he goes to great lengths to find sheep. In Luke 15, we, we have this beautiful and powerful image of a shepherd leaving 99 sheep. He had 100 sheep but one was lost and he left 99 behind to go find one. So when we sing the song, Reckless Love, and we said he left the 99, this is what we're singing about, this beautiful imagery. Any logical, smart shepherd would not leave 99 because now you leave 99 exposed, but he says that one matters to me so much 
that I will go after it. So when a shepherd would go after a sheep and bring that sheep back into the fold, usually that sheep would feel neglected, that sheep needed attention, that sheep most likely suffered some kind of ailment that needed healing and restoration. And what's interesting is that shepherd would carry the sheep back if needed, and then he would keep that sheep close to him. And that sheep would end up being one that would trust the shepherd more than ever before because he came after it. I think that's our relationship when we are truly saved, when we are found by our shepherd. We stay close to him because we know that we can trust him. Jesus came to seek the lost. What's interesting, and I won't go into right now, is that not only is Jesus the good shepherd, but he was also the perfect lamb without blemish. He teaches us how to be a sheep in this world. Again, always highlighting this imagery of God caring for us, pursuing us, redeeming his people. As the sheep trusts the shepherd, greater is the obedience. Now, this word obedience tends to be a word we kind of cringe at or roll our eyes a little bit. But for a sheep, I mean, there is freedom in, in that obedience because I'm trusting the shepherd. The shepherd says, go this way, and then within this space, I'm free. He says, I, I create these precepts and these laws and these mandates for you because I love you, not because I'm trying to control your life, not because I wanna feel like a shepherd, I have something to do. The whole idea is I want you to be safe. I want you to be free. I want you to experience the fullness of everything that I have for you. So the question is, will you trust God with his ways over yours? Will I? See, the disciples of Jesus were known as those who left everything to follow him. That's what they were known for. Whatever it took, they followed Jesus with their entire lives. And Jesus comes across this rich young ruler who has upheld the law, who knew everything, was incredibly religious, and crossed every T, dotted every I, did things by the book. And yet there's this pride in him. He says, hey, I've done everything. And he lists out the commandments to Jesus. He has his exchange. And Jesus says, yes, but you lack one thing. You lack one thing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. And yet he lacks one thing. He was away from the shepherd. He says, I want you to go and sell all your stuff. Go have a yard sale. He didn't just say leave everything. He says, go sell all your stuff. In other words, put a price tag on everything you own. And at the end of the day, you tell me if you value that more than you value being with me. And he says that he turned away sad because he had a lot of stuff. Sometimes we value our human relationships and our stuff more than we do our relationship with our shepherd, which keeps us from experiencing everything God wants for us. The sheep grow in their relationship with Christ. We're gonna talk about that on, on Saturday, how we grow in that. It's a process where we become more trustful of the shepherd, fully reliant on our shepherd. Where we rely on our shepherd for our survival and longevity. We can't experience, many things, I think we want to experience the benefits of the shepherd, but not be close to the shepherd. You're just gonna be one of those sheep that just hangs out in the back. Everybody goes, we'll hang out, maybe I'll grab something, it'll be kind of cool. I'll just be close enough. But he says, I want you to be close to me, by my side. Because cultivating a relationship with the shepherd is crucial. As sheep, our life depends on us listening to the shepherd and hearing his voice. Part of that means we might need to carve some space in our lives for us to, to listen differently, to be quiet sometimes. We just sang about us crying out and God responding. That takes a little bit of time for us to learn. It's more than just simply reading the Bible and praying and coming to church with your great spiritual disciplines, but there are others that when times get tough and we feel stuck and how do, where do we turn next, that God shows up that our shepherd comes to us. And this is the importance of us being around the flock, others who are also listening to the shepherd. It tend, there, it, within the flock, there tends to be one who's, who seems to be the leader, if you will. 
and that one tends to listen to the shepherd and then all the other flocks start to go along with. There's usually a ram or one of these dominant sheep. We benefit from each other beyond just Sunday morning gatherings of how we will grow into everything God has for us. It's important to note that we are rescued by the good shepherd and we become not only part of his flock, but we become part of his kingdom work. But the kingdom of God and what he does starts here in us. Regardless of your age, your experience of where you've been, he has proven that he will go to great lengths to find us, to bring us back for us to follow him, for us to trust him in everything. So when I read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm like, really? I lack nothing? I have everything I need? Anybody need anything today? Like, I have to buy a car. That's one of the things I still have to do. Some of you are like, I need some peace of mind. I need some wisdom. I need some direction. I need some healing in my life. I need you to heal a dysfunctional relationship. But yet, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. But I want some stuff. How do we reconcile these things? I think part of what the psalmist is saying here is that God is leading my life. And if God is with me, then really and truly, I need nothing else. I am content in him knowing that he will provide what I need when I need it. The abundance of God is different than ours. We think abundance is I have leftovers, I have all of this stuff. God says the abundance is that everything in this world is mine and I will give you what you need when you need it. Therefore, I lack nothing because I am with thee. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. God will provide in ways that you never thought possible. One of the greatest gifts the shepherd wants to give his sheep, all of us, is rest. Spiritual rest first, which Hebrews talks about. That the ultimate rest is given to us through the obedience of Jesus Christ. So he says, strive therefore to rest in the completed work of Christ. Through Christ's obedience, you and I can have spiritual rest. And not rest because we've worked ourselves like crazy. Maybe we need that kind of physical rest, psychological rest. Spiritual rest, and in so many different dimensions of rest. But he says, I will give you all of this rest, but it starts here. And here's the thing about rest. A sheep will not rest unless it feels safe. I don't know if you've ever approached a sheep. I have a couple times, trying to scare them off. Those little boogers run away fast. I remember we were in a field trip, and the guy with a farm in Kentucky, he was like, hey, who wants to shave the sheep? And I was like, yeah, not me. And this guy, we were in third grade, Mark's like, I'll do it. And Mark went over there trying to be funny, tried to grab the sheep, and the sheep kicked the crap out of the Mark. It was awesome to watch. And then that sheep took off. And the, and the farmer, shepherd, I don't know what he was, had to go after it. But they're startled. A sheep will not rest unless it feels safe. And the only place that we will find that rest that our soul seeks is in the presence of Jesus. Some of you today are longing for this rest. You're weary. You're tired of trying to figure everything out on your own and this image management, and you're done with it. Come to him. Come to him. And every image we get of this good shepherd is that he is gentle. He is loving and caring. He restores my soul, and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. See, there's a restorative factor when we're able to rest in Christ. Some of you need to be restored in your soul. You've been burned. You're hurting. God wants to restore that soul. Some of you have lost the joy of your salvation. He wants to restore that. Your purpose, he wants to restore that in you. He wants to, and here's the beautiful thing of of his restoration. It's not just, I take you here, have some water, here's a beautiful place to hang out. He says, but now I'm gonna lead you down paths of righteousness. That means how you live matters. What you do matters. How you respond to his provision 
matters. It's called obedience. It's a beautiful thing. It doesn't make sense to us and to this world, but he says, hey, come to me. I'm the good shepherd. It leads us to this path where we trust and obey him. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Regardless of what I'm facing, regardless of what you're facing, I don't know what it is. Disease, cancer, bankruptcy, separation, betrayal. I don't know what it is. But though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because that which the enemy wanted to use for evil, God will use for good. For you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We can have that declaration within us that God is going to lead us, that God is with me regardless of when I look around and my circumstances don't make sense and I can try to judge God of his faithfulness based on my circumstances, which is incredibly dangerous. But regardless of what that is, that I shall not want, that God is with me here and now and that he'll lead me moving forward. This is the God that the psalmist is declaring to be good. So why would we not trust him? He says, your rod and your staff. We think of like the shepherd with the staff of the stupid Christmas plays and everything that we do. It's more than that. That was a rod that was used to rescue, that's to steer, to protect. So God, would you use that, whatever you have to in my life to correct me? If God doesn't correct, that means he doesn't love. He corrects and disciplines because he loves us. So open ourselves up and not be too proud to allow God to to shift something within us. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. This anointing, if you will, over the sheep was a symbol of healing, essentially. When a sheep was beaten, had a bruise, they would put oil on it. They put oil around its nose to keep it from getting bugs inside because they don't have fingers like we do so they can't pick their noses. So they would bang their heads and hurt themselves. It was preventive, preventative in, in that sense. But at the same time, it's, it's this beautiful image of saying that he brings healing to the places of our soul that need it. And surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a promise to us. This isn't just when we die. It starts here and now as we follow the good shepherd. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you have drawn near to us. Lord, that regardless of how far we have wandered, of how hard we've been lost or how long we've been lost, Lord, that you have come after us at great lengths. And when we're still yet dead in our sins, you came for us and we can say, Lord, you have found us. And your love is so great and you're so good that you don't just leave us there. You continue to lead us in the paths of righteousness. Lord, may we walk those paths as difficult as they may be so that we can please you, so you can be glorified in our midst. Lord, we want to experience the fullness of of your presence in us. Holy Spirit, move. Bring about restoration in our souls to the measure that we need it. Restore our joy. Bring peace to our anxiety. Encouragement to wherever there's depression. to those places where we feel like our backs are up against the wall and we have nowhere to turn. Lord, would you lead us through that valley now? For you are faithful, you are good, you are competent, you are powerful. So all of us, in some measure, may we increase our trust in you. And we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, our, our time in, at Holy Communion, at the table where we celebrate this sacrament, reminds us of our need for God's guidance, 
of our need for his grace and his goodness, his love, his mercy, and his healing. We remember that the body was broken for us on Calvary's cross, that we may eat and be filled in remembrance of him. We remember that his blood was poured out for us, that we may be poured out for the world in remembrance of him. And all these things Christ has prepared a way for us that we could not accomplish on our own. We talk about that shepherd and this redeemer. We cannot accomplish this on our own. It's like that verse from first, from first Peter that we started the service with today. We like sheep have gone astray. But we are reminded that now we have returned to the shepherd and the overseers of our soul. Would you pray with me as our servers come forward? Lord, we come before you, our great shepherd, and ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us that are gathered here. Would you pour yourself out on this bread and this wine? Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. Lord, pour out your spirit on us that we would be one with you, that we would be one with each other in the gift of this church, and that we could come together to be in ministry to all of the world until you come in your final victory, Lord, and we feast together at your heavenly banquet. Lord, through your son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church, we bring all honor and glory to you, almighty Father, now and forever. As we celebrate communion here, I'll just remind you that this is an open table, which means that this isn't Foundry's table. This isn't um, any one denomination's table, but this table is open to all who seek to hear the shepherd's voice. I know that at certain times in my life, I have, I have heard it clearer than others, and that isn't on him, that is on me. But Louise talks about these disciplines and the things that we do as the church where we can come closer to Christ, where, where we can hear him better. And this table is an opportunity for us to do that today. There are so many promises in Psalm 23 for restoration and safety and rest and provision, but they all start with the same one call, to follow the Lord as our shepherd. Friends, you may approach. Come forward and be fed.
Of sheep in here right now. You not you may not be in the habit of seeing yourself as a sheep. I want to encourage you to take Psalm 23 this week, different times, and read through it slowly and see what God may be saying about Himself to you, how He wants to lead you, heal you protect you, nourish you. But live into that this week. So go in his peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh